just wah. Y'all ready? Yeah. Her thumbs are going up. It's, it's right. It's time. It's time. It's time. Y'all ready? You ready? Woo! Okay, me too. I'm ready. I'm ready. I know I sound a little crazy today, but sometimes I are. I have a message for you today, and the message is it's not about works, or is it? It's not about works, or is it? Um, I know the same way that you believe that we do not earn our way into heaven. There's no works to get God's approval or acceptance. I believe that. I know you believe that. We are saved by grace, through faith, not of anything that we have done. It is a free gift from God. Amen? Yeah. Y'all agree with me, right? Yeah. That's how we get there. I'm not getting to heaven based on what I did. Hello? Yeah. You're not getting to heaven based on what you did. Thank God. Aren't we all grateful <laughs> that we didn't get disqualified along the way? Oops. It gets quiet when you say that. When you say that, you know, it's so funny because you say it in church, and everybody goes, <laughs> the eyes get straight. I want to read some scriptures to you that are probably familiar, but these are out of the book of James. James chapter 2. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go, kind of go in reverse order on some things. James chapter 2, verse 20 says this. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that's a nice way to talk to people. You foolish fellow, are you willing to recognize that faith without works is useless? That word there is actually dead. That's a better translation. If you look in the New King James Version, it says, faith without works is dead. That word is the Greek word nekros. Um, it's used 132 times in the New Testament, and 132 times... It's translated dead, <laughs> except in this translation on that verse, it says useless. I just want you to understand our faith without works is not just of no use, no value. It's literally dead. Um, I'm going to, I need your help, and I'm not going to make you move anywhere. Can I borrow your sweater? Can I borrow it now? Sure. Thank you. That, RJ, get, get that sweater from her. and I will return it, I promise. <laughs> the, the scriptures say, thank you, let me, let me see that. This was unplanned, but, or I would have brought one, you know, not, not taken yours. So, um, faith without works is dead. That works, the word works there is corresponding action. The corresponding action to what we learn produces life. Corresponding action means I believe this, so I do. I believe this, so yes. I do. Yes. There's a corresponding action. Apart from that, the faith by itself has no life in it. It's, it's merely words. Just the same way is the body without the spirit is dead, so then faith without works is dead. This is a representation of the body. So I'm not going to put it on because I don't want to stretch it out because I have these massive muscles and it will stretch this out <laughs> if I put that on. So anyway, if I, this is the flesh. Housing the spirit. And if I were to set the flesh aside, it doesn't move it's there's no life in this alone there's no life in your flesh it's the spirit inside you that gives life to your mortal body and the, the word of God says that we've been united to Jesus we've been completely united with him and the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead gives life to our mortal body do you I repeat that verse almost Almost daily, I repeat that verse. I speak things over my body. When my body tries to not act the way it should act, which is perfectly healed and youthful, because my youth is renewed like the eagle, then I tell it, flesh, 
My youth is renewed like the eagle. And I want you to know something. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead gives life to you. And you're going to operate in that life. I say that almost every day. If anything tries to put pain, if I feel a pain in my body, I say something. It doesn't mean that I don't feel pain. But I say something to my body immediately because I believe what I read. Uh, we were playing tennis on Friday, and um, Juan is incredibly mean. I mean, you wouldn't think it. He seems nice until you play a sport against him. And if he knows something will possibly cause you injury, he will do that so that you will injure yourself, and he will say, are you okay? So he, he has this shot called a drop shot where he just will knife it. It'll barely clear the net, and you're way back there, and so you have to take off run as hard as you can to get to the ball, and you might barely, barely get to it, and then you have this much room to come to a complete stop from a full run before you hit the net and go all the way tumbling over the net. And then once you do get it, you finally hit the perfect shot, and it goes over, and you stop, and he bumps it over your head. <laughs> Drop shot lob. Yes, he plays like a little old lady. But anyway, <laughs> um, he's got this craft. And so we were playing the other day, Friday I think it was, and he hit a ridiculous drop shot that almost came back to his side of the net. Yeah, it was bad. It, it was so mean. And I don't know how to quit, so I ran as hard as I could and, hard, and almost, almost got it. But then when we, it, it was game point too, so it wasn't, it wasn't important. So then we took a water break and I went and sat down for a second. When I went and sat down, I realized, ooh, I tweaked my hip flexor. I mean, really, really bad. I could feel it. It was like, ooh. And so I had a little bit of this, and one goes, you okay? Because he really cared. And, uh, and, and I went, and I, sat, I said, yeah, I'm okay. And I, and, I was, and I had to stretch it a little bit. I thought, ooh, man, that is not good. So I don't say anything. I'm just talking to my body. Me and him, my body are having a conversation that you're healed. And so I just, when I walk to get ready to start again, I'm just talking to it and telling it what it's going to do and what I believe and what the Word of God says. And then I get the towel, and we played, I don't know, a couple more games and stuff. And, and Juan asked me when we were ready to leave, how's your hip? And I thought, I hadn't thought about it. Because it didn't cross my mind again once I told it what it was going to do, and it never hurt again. And it doesn't hurt, and there's no injury, and there's no... Now, I'm not trying to say that to, like, look, look at me. I'm trying to say that, but that's a habit that I've built over years and years because I know that faith without works and corresponding action is dead. So I put some things to the test. Thank you. And um, I was in a... When I first came into the kingdom and I was learning some of this stuff... I told y'all, this is just on the area of faith. We're going to get to something else in a second. But just on the area of faith, which is very important with these scriptures, there are things that happened because I would put the word in me, listen to me. I did not do things to try to test God. I didn't do things out of arrogance. I didn't do things out of presumption. But there were things that I would do or say that would just come out of me because I would fill myself with the word. That's not bragging. It's just it, I had an opportunity to do that more than most people did in my full-time job. So I had a certain advantage. God, knowing where I would be eventually, was sitting me in a, in a chair, and I was listening to the Word of God for sometimes seven hours every day of the week. So I was getting word that some people just don't have that opportunity to get. You know what I'm saying? And so... When I first came into the kingdom, I had suffered an injury in my ankle. I had popped off a, a piece of the bone on my ankle, and I didn't have insurance, and I didn't have any money, so I didn't get anything done to it. I just, I got an x-ray. <laughs> I could see it, but I couldn't do anything about it. And so it affected me. I could no longer kick with my right leg. My right leg was my power leg. Um, I, I couldn't run. I couldn't jump rope because if I hit on the right, it would just give because it had damaged not only the bone but even the tendons in the foot whenever I caused that injury. So um, I got prayer, and, and God healed me. And after he healed me, I started jogging 
a couple times a week, three times a week, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, we would jog, jog three miles. And so I didn't like jogging. I still don't like jogging. I believe the word of God says that only the wicked flee when no man is chasing them. So I don't like to just run without somebody chasing me. So I was jogging, and every time I would get to the finish, finishing part, I would have to cross over an overpass, I-10, an, an overpass that went over I Interstate 10. It was at Studebont, and actually one area back that I think, it's, think it might have been Houston Avenue went across. And so I would jog that last bit. It's the last bit of the three miles. I'm just about done. And this pain would come back to my ankle. And I would just start feeling it. And I'm like, no, I'm healed. So I would just start talking to my body. I'm healed. No, no, I'm healed. And I'd keep on moving. And then I would see in my own heart, I would see the Lord in me just moving. And I'd say, okay, Lord's just carrying me. Lord, and I would just finish. And it happened dozens of times but then it would come for that one moment and it would go away and i would just say no i'm healed so anyway i was in the in the warehouse i had my punching bag up i've told y'all the story before punching bag is hanging here i'm doing some training i'm still competing in martial arts at that time and i i i, I hit the bag and when i did i did a real quick side kick with my right leg that was my best kick and i just pow I popped it real good and when i popped that bag it felt like when I first broke my ankle. I mean, I, it, the pain just went into me immediately, and I went, pow, ah, I screamed loud. The warehouse was empty, and it echoed through there. It was loud because, I mean, it was, it was painful. And as soon as I, I realized what just happened, I screamed, no, and I threw the bag, and the bag just swung way out on its chain, and I waited for it to come back, and when it come in full force, I went into it and kicked it as hard as I could. And when I kicked the bag, boom, the pain left my ankle and never has come back. I don't encourage you to do that. I did not think of something to do out of rage. My spirit rose up in such a fury that I knew that I knew that I knew that I was healed. How dare you? How dare you, devil, try to give me a counterattack, make me think I'm not healed? I'm healed. That's where I was. It, I've heard of people, you know, stomping their glasses to, to prove that, they, that their vision has been healed, throwing their medication down the toilet. You're going to just go have to buy medication and get your glasses fixed. Unless something is going on by the Spirit of God and you know that you know, then I'm not encouraging people to just do an act of faith. But there sometimes is a corresponding action that just comes out of your spirit because there's life in you that's doing that. And that faith with corresponding action has fruit that comes to it. You understand what I'm, what I'm saying? So I'm not trying to tell us to do something crazy, but I'm telling you that when we fill ourselves with the Word of God, something will cause us to do a corresponding action not because we're trying to prove, is God right or is God not right? It just, it, you know. I think it was uh, Brother Kenneth Hagin used to talk, talk about being, when you're in real faith, it's called being fully persuaded. Fully persuaded means you can't talk me out of it. You can keep talking. You can't talk me out of it. Like someone may come, well, oh, you kicked the bag and your, your ankle hurt. You might need to go get it checked again. You may not be shut up i mean you're not you're not going to change my mind because of a physical symptom you, i mean i'm not trying to argue with you and i'm not trying to be stubborn i am only stubborn in the fact that i know what god did and you can't take it from me i'm fully persuaded and it's it's so real to me it's exactly the same if you're trying to tell me i don't know if you're saved it's like, you can't talk me out of this it's not like it's a mindset. This is real. This is real. So look in verse 23. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buzz 22. I'm going to buzz through this pretty quick. Um, I'm sorry, 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? Abraham, I offered Isaac because God said, I want you to sacrifice Isaac to me. And Abraham did it. He offered him on, on 
the sacrifice. He took him with him to sacrifice him. And he knew the sacrifice entailed this, killing him and spilling blood and then burning him. He knew he had to bring wood and he had to create a fire. He knew there was something that was, this was going to be it. But the word of God says that he saw him. Abraham saw that Isaac would, if need be, be raised up from the ashes. Because he knew the promise was that real. God said the covenant comes through that young man, and that young man is being offered to God. So I guess God's still going to have to raise him from the dead, put all of his ashes back together, and make a body out of him. I don't know how God does that, but God's God. So here we go. He went to the point of killing him, raised his knife, and the Lord said, stopped him at that point. God did not tell Abraham, I want to see if you're willing. He just told him to do it. That's right. And when he stopped him, that committed, you understand, that committed God. Abraham was willing to give his son, and now God was committed to give his. Now God was like, what can I withhold from them? The son of promise was offered to me. Now I'm going to offer mine. And because of his willingness to obey, do you understand what that covenant did? He had a covenant with Abraham. He's like, then you get the best offering. You get the Lamb of God. Oh, man, this is huge. Corresponding action is huge. Faith without works is dead, but there's corresponding action that brings life. You see, faith that, that, you see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. It wasn't saying, yes, God, I will give you anything. That's great. Give me your son. Well, Lord, I know that if you did require him, I would do that. I'm requiring him. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Abraham believed God. Abraham was from the south. That's why it says it was reckoned to him. I reckon, I reckon he's faithful. It was reckoned to him as righteousness because he believed God. Faith is what made him righteous. It was faith in the covenant. Faith in the covenant. Faith in the covenant. You understand what got him to be righteous? Faith in the covenant. The same thing that makes us righteous. It's not what we do. It's faith in in the covenant, blood was shed for me. I have faith in that blood covenant that I'm in yes. that causes me to walk righteous. Do you know that when, you know the story in Genesis when God made this covenant with Abraham, that he had Abraham get these animals and slice them in half and he separated the body parts. They put one half on this side, one half on that side. And part of the covenant, they would walk a figure eight around the pieces. That's right. They would walk it, eternal. Eternal covenant, unbreakable. And they would walk through the blood just like that. So what did God do? God put Abraham to sleep. Abraham wakes up. There's a furnace. There's a burning furnace and a torch going through the pieces. You know why? Because God didn't require Abraham to walk through the blood. He didn't, call, he didn't require him to walk through the pieces to be, for the covenant to be ratified. He didn't make a covenant with Abraham. He made a covenant with himself. So it couldn't be broken. He let Abraham partake in the covenant. He watched and saw it being ratified. And he was in awe as God made a covenant with himself that could never be broken. And he was partaker of a covenant. And so are we. God, again, made a covenant with himself. And Jesus fulfilled it for us because we couldn't do it. We weren't perfect. We weren't spotless. We couldn't be a lamb. You see, a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. 
There's something that has to correspond with. There's something that has to have action. In the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when, when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Rahab the harlot was righteous and justified because she helped the children of Israel. She helped the plan of God. And she's in the lineage of Jesus. Did you know that? Rahab's in the lineage of Jesus. Now I'm going I'm to go backtrack a little bit. That was James chapter 2, verse 20 through 26. I want to go James chapter 2, verse 15. We're going to go back a little bit. We're doing really good on time too, guys. Okay. This is what he says in verse 15. If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace and be warmed and filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. James chapter 1, we're going to go back to verse 27. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God and the Father is this, to visit orphans, and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. There's works required of us. Do you know one of the works required of us is to take care of widows? It's to take care of orphans? It's, it's a requirement. Even comforting them, contacting them, checking on them. We have widows that we contact, that we check on, that we visit, that we, how are you, and how are, how, how's things going with you? And we, we encourage one another. And visiting orphans is part of the requirement of God. Feeding the poor. When the Gentiles came into the kingdom, the Jews didn't know what to do with them. They didn't know the Bible. They didn't know the, the, they didn't know the Torah. They were like, what do we tell them to do? Was, uh, let's go with some basics, okay? Tell them, look, don't eat things sacrificed to idols. Don't drink blood. They're just trying to give, they're trying to, they're trying to figure this out. They tell, they tell the churches, be sure and take care of the poor. And they said, well, which we already had planned to do. It was, they knew, even starting, starting all over, trying to figure out how this thing is going to work with this new faith of this is the new thing where Gentiles are in this. And we can't train them up on the, in the law. What's still left? The requirements of the law of the sacrificial lamb being slain, is, it's done. There's no longer a sacrificial lamb requirement. There's no longer every year one dies for your sin. There's no longer going to the high priest because now there's one high priest who never dies. There's one lamb who's been slain forever. And so these requirements of the law no longer exist, but there are some things of the law that do still exist, and I, this is going to twist some of you all backwards. For a second. What do you mean requirements of the law that still exist? The requirements of the law that still exist are things like this. Uh, love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your might. That was in the law. Do you know that? The new covenant promise was this, and I will take my laws and I will write them on the fleshly tablets of their heart. Now, let me ask you a question. If the law is bad, why does he want to put it on my heart? Amen, amen. If the law is bad and grace good, law bad, grace good, law bad, grace good, law bad, then why would put his laws on my heart? He didn't say, I will take these stony tablets and the law away and I will write grace, grace, grace over their heart. It's not what he said. There are differences in what the word law means. Just like there are differences in the word death. There's a physical death and there's a spiritual death. Am I right? Sometimes it just says dead. 
You know there's different words for sleep? Sometimes in the scripture when it says sleep, you're, t- you're resting. Sometimes when it says sleep, you're dead. <laughs> Jesus is returning and those who are asleep, those who are, have already fallen asleep will come and return with him. They're not taking a nap. They pass before us. And law, there's, there's the law requirements and there's the law that is God's precepts, his ordinance, his ways. This is the way, these are the ways of God. And so they're not evil. They're not wrong. Do you understand? So we don't have all the same ceremonial things anymore. You need to do this. If you touch someone that is unclean, if you touch the leper in the old covenant, then you were unclean. If you touch a leper in the new covenant, they become clean. Hello? A woman with the issue of blood touched Jesus. He would have been unclean except the fact that as soon as she touched him, she was clean. John chapter 5 verse 28 says this. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth. Those who did the good deeds, hello? You mean deeds and works are important? This is what it says. Those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life. Deeds, works. Those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. (laughs) Jesus said this. Good deeds are important. All this stuff, I believed in Jesus. I said a prayer. I'm going to heaven. Uh, Okay. But did you really, really believe? Did you really give it all? Did Did he take the life or did you say a prayer? Because I promise you, I can go to the pet store and get a parrot that'll say the same prayer. (laughs) It's not the words that that save us. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 12. Now, if any man builds on the foundation of gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it because... It is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will testify the quality of each man's faith. No, each man's work. Each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he'll receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, He will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. (laughs) So there's works. There's works that won't do you any good, but you're still saved. It says they're still saved, but through fire. There's no reward because there's nothing left. And so it doesn't matter if it's in the name of religion and the name of Jesus and the name of whatever you want to say. It doesn't matter how you did the works. It's here. It's the motive of the heart. It's why we did them. It's with the heart of Jesus or not with the heart of Jesus. It's out of outflowing of love or it's out of just meaningless repetition and doing something to gain approval and to gain rank. And that's one of the words right now that I could spit almost every time I hear the body of Christ is talking so much about rank that it's becoming rank to hear about it. I don't care if you're an apostle. I really don't care if you're an apostle, self-proclaimed whatever, or everybody calls you apostle, or if you're a prophet, pastor, evangelist, teacher. It's not this ranking system that God's after. If we haven't learned anything yet, I mean, I don't know who... I don't know who got this bright idea to interpret one verse... And think there's this ranking system in all the kingdom. It's the most bizarre thing I've ever seen. An apostle is a sent one. Do you know who the greatest sent one ever was? was? There's one right answer and it's pretty easy. You know his name? 
Jesus was a sent one. How many times did they call him apostle Jesus? Never. That's, that's sad because then he would have rank. At the top. But poor Jesus was just a servant. It's so bizarre. He's, he left us with the most important thing at the end. He said, look, guys, as you've seen of me, do that. Did you see that I just washed your feet, that I served, served you? Do what I do. Get a towel. Don't display your mantle. Display your towel. It's about serving. It's about doing what he would do if he was here. And he did everything the opposite of what everybody expected him to do. He captured an entire world. He, he brought a dominion of a gr the greatest kingdom and never, ever had to kill someone to do it. Just himself. And he says, do as I do. Die to yourself, and you'll raise up a stronger kingdom than trying to gain a kingdom by killing everybody else with the Bible. It's not about works bringing salvation. It's about rewards because of, of doing the works of the Father. We are going to be rewarded for doing the works of the Father. We just got through saying that. There are rewards. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Everybody doesn't get the same rewards. Everybody doesn't seek him. It's not about works for salvation. But I will tell you, the works are important. Jesus said this in John chapter 9, verse 4. We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. Works are not done to gain approval from God they're not done to gain acceptance they're not done to gain love we work from approval from acceptance from love not toward that trying to gain it we have it and that gives us the authority to give it away I'm, I'm closing I really am this is the last thing that I want you to get out of if nothing else I want you to get this right here the works that we do are a response to the Father's love that has been given to us even though we didn't deserve it. The works that we do are a response to that love. Uh, our works become a love response that's rooted and grounded in love. It's rooted in that. And, and so we get filled with that love and, and our awareness. If you don't know how much God loves you, how can you overflow that love to somebody else? You know, love your neighbor as you love yourself. It's not, people are so confused with this. Social media is rampant with all this garbage. You just need to love yourself. Get more value of yourself. Love yourself. Love yourself. Because if you don't love yourself, then you can't love anybody else. And it's not a matter about, a, about loving yourself. It's about the awareness of the love that's already in you. It's the love that's already in you. Do you understand the difference? Because this self-love, the world has that in abundance. They have the, an abundance of self-love. It's not doing them any good. Not doing anybody else any good. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as you are loved. You've been loved tremendously. I've been loved tremendously. I've been loved way beyond what I deserved. Way, 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 way beyond what I deserved. So I could, I could definitely extend mercy. I can love somebody that seems unlovable because I'm, I'm the same. The people that we adore, guys, who do we talk about? Even when our worship... There are songs written about pouring our love out, pouring our oil out, aren't there? We all have that pour our love on you, pour our oil on you, right? Lots of, lots of beautiful songs written about that. What's it about? It's about someone aware that they don't deserve the love that's coming toward them. 
And in that receiving of such amazing love and mercy and grace, they poured it back out on Jesus. They're like, how could you love me? And they pour this gratitude back on him. And that's what we do in our worship. We're like, I pour my love on you because you're pouring this unconditional love out on me that I don't deserve. And it's filling me up so much that I just can't help but reciprocate that. I can't help but give more of that back to you. It's just coming in an overflow. And that's what loving other people is about. So full of understanding of our mercy that we just, we can't help but extend mercy. How can we judge somebody? How can I judge you? How can I judge you knowing me? How can I judge anyone knowing me? Like I said the other day, a quote that I read, I thought, I thought that's perfect. It says, do not be upset with anybody that doesn't like you because you're way worse than they know. If they only knew it all. I mean, you don't like me now. If you knew it all, you really wouldn't like me. But he loves me. And because I can receive his love, I can show love. And listen, until you can receive love, until you can receive mercy, you can't truly give it out. You can do works. I go to the orphanage. I go to the jails. I feed the poor. But you don't feed it with that heart, the heart of God, because you haven't even received the heart of God. And we spend a lifetime here learning how to receive the same mercy until mercy comes out of us from the overflow, not from, I'm going to do some work so I have rewards. It's all selfish again. It backtracked all the way back to selfishness again. I'm going to do good things for me. It has to come out of the overflow. Last verse, Matthew 10, verse 8. Heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers. Raise the dead. Cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Freely give. You know how the miraculous is going to come out of us? From just being full of all that mercy. And then when you see someone hurting, you don't, Calculate if they're worthy of healing or not. <laughs> there are people that will not pray for someone who's sick until they receive Jesus first. Like, if you pray to receive Jesus, I'll pray for you. you get, there are people that if a Muslim asks them for prayer, they'll be like, well, you, do you believe Jesus is the only true Savior? If you receive Jesus in your heart, I'll pray for you for healing. Jesus didn't do that. Who are we to put requirements on someone else to receive God's? I'm not the healer. <laughs> I'm not the healer. It's his mercy that heals. I'm not fit to be a vessel if I'm choosing how I pour out. Vessels don't choose who they pour on. They're just, I'm a little teacup. <laughs> Pot, whatever it is. Sorry, I haven't sang the song in a while. <laughs> Y'all stand up with me. Faith without works is dead, but I tell you what, the works don't come pure until we learn how to receive all that he's pouring out. And it, this, actually, if you're paying attention, this dovetails off the last two weeks, and it's all about receiving the Father's love. Because if we receive the Father's love, truly receive it, we give it out. Freely we receive, now freely give it away. And part of the works is what we've been crying out for anyway. Part of the works is miracles. Jesus said, if you don't believe my words, at least believe my works. <laughs> he says, hey, go tell John this. <laughs> the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear, and blesses the one who's not offended at me. Lord, we are grateful for your mercy. Help us, God. Remove every obstacle that is keeping us from receiving your love fully. From receiving the love 
that overwhelms us. The receiving the love when we know we don't deserve it. The mercy that comes just because of how good you are. Just because of you. Lord, help us to walk in this love in such a degree that we can sit and bask in your love, that we can be washed in your love, that we can be filled with your love to so much that it overflows. It splashes on people when we come around. It just comes out of us because we're full. And we don't think about it. We don't have to think about it. It's just what's in us to abundance. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth's just going to speak. And so our words will be words of mercy and words of of grace and words of love because we're full. So here we are, God, just asking you to fill us again. Holy Spirit, baptize us right now. Fill us again with the love of God, the power of God that comes from that position of thankfulness. Here's your target, Lord. Your love your mercy, your grace, here's a target right here. We receive it and we give it away. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.